because you have your Bible, or if there's a Bible in front of you, turn to Psalm 139, Psalm 139, and uh, if you're taking notes, uh, simply entitled tonight's Bible study, You Know Me, and we say, you know me. You know me. Turn the person next to you say, you know me. you know me, even though they don't know you. Always say, it's okay, all right, you know me. <laughs> um, it's, it's always just a, a crazy privilege to stand before God's people and to share his word. You know, I often say, uh, who, who, who am I, right? Who are we that God would choose us in spite of who we are? God's love for us extends beyond what I can even see. And so tonight, uh, God led me to Psalm 139. I'm really just going to focus on the last two verses, which really, uh, as we look at it, it's, it's David's heart cry. It's David seeking his, his father's face. It's David saying, uh, I need you, as we sung, God, I need you every hour. And how many, how many related to that song? Anybody? It was just like, man, I, I just need more of Jesus. And I just wanted to read the first, the, the whole chapter. If you get a chance, go home. And maybe as you're reading through this now and, and something sticks out to you, if you got a pen or pencil, maybe underline it, put a star next to it. Like, I'm going to get back to that. Or if a word sticks in your mind, just, just utilize this time now to, to ask the Lord, to, to Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? Because I might share verses 23 and 24, but the Lord might be speaking verse 6 to you. Or we might be speaking verse 9. Has that ever happened to you? You're in a Bible study, right? And the, Bible, the, the pastor or the teacher is teaching something, but your mind goes somewhere else. You know? That's not a bad thing, right? You know? But it's good to listen, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So even tonight, just kind of allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. But Psalm 139, we're going to start at verse 1 and read all 24 verses. And this is what it says. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For it is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You would hedge me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as a day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Here we go, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let me read that to you again, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Uh, David, as he's writing this, um, he's being pursued as most of the Psalms write, as he writes about it. And he's either being he's pursued by Saul or maybe his son in rebellion, Absalom. It's not clearly written, but all we know, he, he's on the run, and he's in a place where he's at a crossroads. And most of us understand what that's like. 
He's in a moment of introspection. He's, it's a moment where he's looking on the inside, seeing where he's been, seeing what he's done, and seeing where God's going to take him. And I think a lot of us, it's good for us to do that, isn't it? To kind of reevaluate. Some of you, you do it at the beginning of the year. You kind of look at the year before, and you kind of see what you didn't do and what you should have done. And you look to the upcoming year, and you see those things that you ought to do or God's placed in your heart. Here, David, as he is writing this, two things, the two themes about this psalm really simply is that he knows that God is omniscient. Everyone say omniscient. Omniscient, omniscient means that God is all, omni being all, and shint. Okay, that's not really a word, but omniscient is all-knowing. Say om, omniscient means all-knowing. Say that. Omniscient means all-knowing. God knows everything. Period. We entitled tonight's study, uh, You Know Me. He knows you. He knows the ins and the outs. He saw that first moment that you fell off your bike at age five. He saw that moment when you had your very first kiss. He saw that moment. He saw it. He was there. As the psalm continues, he really focuses on the fact that, God, you know me. You know me when I sit down. You know me when I rise up. You know the word before I even speak it. And as he's going through this psalm, he's really talking about his relationship with God. He's at a point where he has no other choice than to look to God. I like those moments. There was this book that we read many years ago. It was called Crowded to Christ. Do you understand the things going on in your life, in my life, are crowding us to Christ? And oftentimes, am, am I not the first one to try to avoid those things that crowd me in? Anyone here claustrophobic, right? You don't like to be real cramped. Some of you, you are sitting away from everybody because, you know, some people are just way too close to you, right? So that's why you sit off by, your, by yourself, right? Maybe God wants to crowd you into him tonight. And he's allowing trials and circumstances and people and things to push you to him because you haven't been listening lately. Anyone hard-headed, right? Anyone kind of stubborn? Anyone kind of prideful, right? Nobody here is like that, right? But this is the thing. Oftentimes, God will speak through his word, but oftentimes, God will speak through circumstances. What, what circumstance is God trying to get your attention on tonight? Is there something swirling in your life that you have no idea why it's there? I'll tell you why it's there. God. Because he knows you, and he knows what you need. But not only is he omniscient, uh, God is omnipresent. Everyone say omnipresent. omnipresent. Which means God is everywhere. So not only does he know you, not only does he know me, he is with me. If, if you don't remember anything about the Bible study, and I, I pray that you know this, God knows you, and God is with you. God knows you, and he's with you. If you ever forget that, or if you ever go through a, 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 a down moment, or if you ever go through a, a difficult day or some troubling times, remember that God knows you, and he's going to be with you. Jesus said what? I will never leave you or forsake you. I won't abandon you. I will be with you to the very end of the age. And as David is writing this, it's really, I love it, you get, you get a glimpse of this prayer uh, journal entry into David's life. He's writing this from a heart that's maybe broken. He's writing this from a heart where he has seen so much. People have turned on him. And he gets to the point as he's reading through this, uh, as he's writing through this, he says, hey, where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the highest heights, lowest depths, you are there. Even your hand shall lead me, he says. And as I started to think about this, I started to think about in our own life, that you and I have those moments where we have to take uh, inventory, uh, an honest look, look at ourselves. I like to say most of us like to think we're pretty good, right? And we're always pretty good in comparison to the person next to us, aren't we? I'm a little bit better than them, and I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, right? But in comparison to God, anybody here married? Say amen if you marry, all right. I share this always at uh, mar premarital counseling. In comparison to God, husband and wife, you're always wrong. If you're married, turn to that spouse. It's like, we're always wrong in comparison to God. Tell them that. In comparison to God, you're always wrong, right? God is always right. 
And in this particular psalm, as David is sharing his heart, that God, you are not only omniscient, you're not only all-knowing, you're everywhere that I go, that even if I try to run, Pastor Pat was singing that song, even if I try to run away, right? Even if I run away, your love never fails. And as you and I come to this point in, in our Christianity, I just wanted to focus on a couple of verses here. And there are the last two verses, verses 23 and 24. As David is recounting how God is, good God has been, as David's even talking about, God, your thoughts for me are so much more than the sands of the sea. God, you, you were there <laughs> uh, at the very beginning. He says that, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you. Your eyes saw my substance be uh, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. So David is really just kind of, he's just pouring out his heart to God, and he's sharing all the things that he knows about God. He wrote 24 verses. That's, that's, kinda, that's, that's an encouragement to me, or a challenge to me. Could you write 24 verses of how great your God is? Check this out. On your tough days. Not when, not when things are going good. It's easy, isn't it? God, I love you. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. But on your toughest days, can you write 24 verses of God's goodness? It, it, it's, it's a bit of a heart check, isn't it? Because it's easy to praise God, right? But that song that we hear, I will praise you in the storm. I will write of your goodness. David, as, as he is going through this, this trial in his life, this circumstance, he comes to the point here in verse 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God, and know my hearts. Try me and know my anxieties. And if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I just really want to simply take a quick look at what this means and what this means for us as a church, as a body of Christ. See, the passages before this, verses 19 through 22, I love this. I, I read this and I think, David's a bit kind of schizophrenic here, right? He says, I love you, God, you're so great. And verse 19 is like, oh, I hate the wicked, right? Oh, God, those bloodthirsty men. I hate those who hate you, oh, God. So he turns there. But it's kind of interesting. Haven't you ever said that about somebody else? Haven't you ever said that about maybe a particular group of people? Haven't you said that maybe about maybe the government's? or your city, and you say, you're going to get yours. Vengeance is the Lord, right? But I love this because as David speaks this out, as David writes this out, he's turned back, not to them, but to him. Uh, brothers and sisters, be very careful not to, to judge, right? What do they say when you point the finger, right? This finger, this finger. When you point the finger, right, three are pointing back at you. Oftentimes, we are guilty of the things that we charge others with. And as David is writing this, he's saying all these things, and he realized in comparison to these enemies, to these bloodthirsty men, to these wicked, he says, God, search me. He says, not just search me, but search me thoroughly. Examine me. Explore as if digging for buried treasure, Right? If you anyone ever lose something, lost something this week, keys, wallet, money, I don't know what it is. When I lose money, I search for it. I don't know about you guys, right? You're looking, you're looking, right? Or you lose your keys, you lose your cell phone, right? And you turn your whole room or your car upside down trying to locate that, right? And why? Because it's important. David understood the importance of God searching him. He understood that he wanted God to search him inside and out, inside and, out and take this full-on investigation of his heart. To search me, O God, and know my heart. And oftentimes, that's, that's a difficult place to be, isn't it? For someone almost uncomfortable, a bit um, unpleasant, for someone to search us. Now, don't raise your hands, but if you've ever been in a place where you have been searched and frisked before, anyone? No, don't raise your hand. We don't know that. But it's, it's, it's a bit uh, inhibiting, isn't it? You, you feel a bit violated if you ever had your home broken into, right? You kind of feel like that's a personal thing. Asking God to search you is a personal thing, isn't it? As David is writing this, I, I believe it's from an honest heart. 
And I believe it's in comparison to the, to the words he just spoke. He was talking about all these other people, and all of a sudden, it points back to him. And as it points back to him, he is now deliberately putting himself in the spotlight under the magnifying glass and saying, God, discover anything in me that's not right. Oftentimes, we try to, uh, try to run away. We try to hide, right? Try to conceal our sin. And David right here, he says, God, search me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. He says, know my heart. That, that word for know is yada. Everyone say yada. Yada. And it means really that whole idea to discern, to, to recognize, to perceive, to acknowledge. It's that same intimacy in the very beginning of the Bible as Adam knew Eve. And as Adam knew Eve, she conceived. And what was birthed out of that was children. Walk with me here. When I go to God and say, God, search my heart, search me and know my heart. What I'm saying, God, when you know my heart, when you can perceive those things in me, I want something to be birthed out of that. As we talked about earlier, God, when I confess something to you, I know what I want to come out of that. And the word is repentance, isn't it? When I confess to God, I want to repent. I don't want to continue to do that same thing over and over again that I've been struggling with, that I've been dealing with. And that's hard, isn't it? It is hard to come to God and say, I am prideful. God, I am an adulterer. God, I am fill in the blank. But I see it so necessary. David, he understood his God. And as he lists out, God, you know me. God, you're with me. God, I don't like these men. At the same time, God, know my heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is what? Deceitfully wicked. Above all things, who can know it? Right? Who can know your heart? Only God. And he knows those things that are going on in the inside. In Proverbs 4.23, what does it say? Guard your hearts. Protect your hearts. For as a wellspring of life, one other version says this. I love this. For out of your heart determines the course of your life. Isn't that interesting? For out of your heart. Because oftentimes we, we direct our lives by what our heart feels, isn't it? Haven't you done that this week? Haven't you been like, well, I feel like pizza, right? And what do you get? You get pizza, right? Or I feel like watching this show. And what do you do? I watch this show, right? Your heart basically dictates to your mind and your body what you will do. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. Protect it. Keep your heart with all diligence and vigilance. For out of it, it directs your life. Anyone here, I want you to rewind in your life. Rewind in your life to your very first crush. Anyone remember your very first crush, right? That first time, elementary school, junior high school, high school, and I spy with my little eye, mm-hmm, right? You know? It's like, whoa, and your heart, what? You weren't thinking. You were directed by your heart. And guys, most of the time, you, you did something to let that girl know, Right? And ladies, you're not, that, you're, not, you're not that innocent. You know that, right? You know? Ladies, you maybe you know he's watching and like, mm, you know, you do your hair thing, right? Whatever it is. Just because you know why. Because it's in our heart. He says, guard your heart. There's a lot of things that go on in our heart. God says our heart's deceitfully wicked. And who can know it? Only God. And there are times in our life where you and I are directed by our hearts and the things that we do, the things that we say, aren't that nice, is it? In Matthew 12, uh, 34, it says, For out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. I know any, nobody here has anger issues, right? No one here ever gets irritated. No one here ever gets impatient, right? But in those moments, right, what comes out of your mouth? It's what's in your heart, isn't it? Some of us are pretty good at holding it in, right? But oftentimes, and you know when people are trying to hold it in, right? You're talking to are you okay? I'm okay. <laughs> no, 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 really, are, are you okay? I'm okay, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, their eyes start to bug out, you know, their ears turn red, because they're holding it in, holding it in. For out of the abundance of the mouth, uh, abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So real simple tonight, 
If you were to say, God, search me and know my heart, what would God see? What God sees, I don't want anyone else to see, right? I'd be ashamed if you were to see what was really in my heart today. You would be a bit grieved as you saw what would be in other people's hearts today. Flat out, I, I realize here, David, real simply, he says, God, search me, know me, know my heart, and I'm a sinner. We are all sinners saved by grace. Do me a favor, turn to that person next to you and say, we are all sinners saved by grace. Tell them that. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all sinners saved by grace. And, and you might think, why does why is Dennis always make us do that? The more I hear it, the more I believe it. Repetition keeps my learning, doesn't it? The more I hear it, the more I hold on to it. And maybe tonight that's what you need to know, that I'm simply a sinner saved by the grace of God. David says, search my heart. Search it. Dig deep. Find all the dirt that's in there, God. And once you've found that dirt, would you just blow it away? Would you remove it? Against you, David said in Psalm 51, against you, God, and only you have I sinned against. And maybe that's where you're at tonight. Maybe you are at a spot and God wants to search your heart. Maybe you're holding on to your heart and he says, remove your hand and let me examine your heart and what's in there. As he goes on, he says here real simply, not only to know his heart, to search his heart, but he says here in the second part of verse 23, try me and know my anxieties. That word to try means to test, uh, to investigate, to prove, right? I love the Lord that oftentimes he will test us to see if we've learned uh, what we were reading, or oftentimes there are things that go on in our life, and, and I absolutely hate it in this sense. And maybe you can understand this. Oftentimes when God teaches me a concept, uh, maybe to be patient, right? The very next day, the very next hour, guess what? I get taste, uh, tested in the area of patience. Is God testing you in the area? The testing that it refers to here is like the idea of testing metals. And I, and I looked this up and I thought this was interesting. The reason for testing metals, whether it's tin or copper or gold, whatever it would be, it, the procedure by which metal, metals are tested before they are put to use. Before you can use pure iron, before you can use pure aluminum, it has to be tested for its purity. And then it can be used. So what David is saying here real simply is that, God, I want you to use me, but would you test me? Would you test me and remind me why you're allowing this in my life? Go ahead and turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, a very famous verse that each of us should know. If you don't know, uh, underline it, redline it, do what you need to do, highlight it. But I think this is real important for you, each of us as believers in Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, in this whole idea that when we're tested by God, it's meant to prove that we're the real deal, that our heart is genuine, that we're truly following the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. He says this, In this you greatly rejoice, thou, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter the Apostle, he says here real simply, I want you to rejoice in this. Though for a little while you've been grieved by various trials, the reason for this is to test, to see the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, and it's tested by fire. Oftentimes, uh, we've heard the analogy or the thought in, in the Bible about the refiner's fire and the whole idea when they grab, uh, have the gold. In order for the gold to be made pure, it's tested by fire. As, a, as the gold is boiling, all, 
all the gunk, all the things that cause the impurities in the gold is lifted up. And the goldsmith would take a spoon and he would take all the impurities, all the things that aren't, aren't pure to gold out of that, that pot of gold. And it's often said the reason, the time that you would know that the gold is pure is when the goldsmith can see his reflection in the gold. And maybe that's what's been going on in your life lately. Maybe God has turned up the heat. Maybe the intensity of the trials. Maybe the volume of the arguments have gone up. Maybe the voices in your head of the enemy have been amplified. Has, has the, the fire been turned up in your life? And if so, realize God is using it to test. You, God is using it to try. God is using it for your own benefit. He says here, don't think it's strange, right? In this, you greatly rejoice. Understand God has a great purpose in those things. One of the things I realize, and maybe you can understand this too, is oftentimes I run from the trials that God wants to use in my life to make me more like him. Um, don't be a runner from God. Way too often, God's will is difficult, I'll tell you that. It's, it's hard at times. It's hard to follow what he says, but I'll tell you this. It's the greatest blessing that you could ever have. See, uh, Charles Spurgeon says, Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil, and they let us see what we are made of. Let those trials dig up that soil that's in your heart to show you what you're really made of. When I read through this, and I read through David and his whole idea, God not only search me, not only know my heart, not only test me and try me, but he says here, know my anxieties, know my thoughts, know my mind. What are those things that keep you up late at night? Those worries, the finances, the issues with the children. What are those things that weigh heavy upon your, your, your mind when you're all alone, Right? What are those things that are constantly bugging you in your mind? David says, God, not only test my heart, but know my anxieties, know my mind, know my thoughts, know those things that are going on. There are those, disquiet, this, those disquieting thoughts that are in there. Basically, it's this. My thoughts versus his thoughts. In Philippians, he says, have this mind that is like Christ Jesus to consider others better than ourselves. And the more and more, I, I'll tell you this, folks, the more and more I think I'm getting closer and closer to Jesus, the more and more, the less I know. <laughs> Can you guys relate to that? You realize, man, I think I'm really, really close, but in comparison to God, I'm not as close as I think I am. And oftentimes, as, as you and I draw into the Lord, as you and I realize that we have these anxieties, we have these things that keep us up late at night. Psalm 94, 19 says, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, your comforts delight my soul. This is what I can tell you tonight. As Philippians says, think on these things, meditate on these things, those things which are lovely, those things which are right, those things which are praiseworthy. Think on those things. He says once again, set your mind on things above and not on the earth. It's oftentimes very easy to focus on me, myself, and I as opposed to the things of God. David says, know my thoughts. I read this. It says, God not only reads the desires of my heart, but he also knows the fugitive thoughts of my head. Right? That idea of a fugitive. Many years ago, was it Harrison Ford? He was in a movie called The Fugitive. Anyone remember watching that movie, right? That's old school, right? But he was a fugitive. And I was thinking, man, the, my, the thoughts in my head, they are fugitive. What? Because they start, they, they keep running. You know what I'm talking about? Real quick example, right? Uh, you might be going home today, and then you're in your car, and you think the one thought, right? I was like, okay, I, I, oh, my, my, my engine light goes on. Okay, I have, to, I have to take care of that, right? And the next day you see the engine light go on, check engine, okay, good. And all of a sudden, well, if I don't get this taken care of, I don't have time this week, 
And if I don't get this taken care of, then you know what's going to happen? Then my car is going to blow up, and I'm going to be on the freeway, and I'm on the freeway, I'm going to run into another car, and that car is going to catch on fire, and the fire department is going to come. You guys know what I'm talking about? How you, the thoughts in your head are fugitive. They keep going on and on and on. And that's a silly example, but anyone ever had to, had to go to the doctor for a testing? And you don't even know the final outcome, but what has ever happened, right? Well, you we found a spot. No! We found a mole. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, okay. But isn't it instantly, right? Our mind goes crazy. That's what it's talking about here. God, test me. Know my anxiousness. Know those, know those things about me, God, that are fugitive, that, that keep running wild. And he says here real simply, God, know my thoughts and my mind. Real quick story, um, and this is uh, kind of along the lines, and maybe this will give you comfort, but when my wife and I uh, were married our first six months, um, we weren't trying to have a baby or anything like that, and as um, one day my wife went to work, and uh, she was bleeding, so she goes to urgent care, and as she goes to urgent care, um, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm uh, at work, or I can't remember the conversation, but she says, I'm bleeding, and they said, um, I'm pregnant. I was like, oh, yay, oh, but bleeding, right? That's kind of not a good thing. And they said, well, um, I have, I have this, uh, this mass, and they basically said, if, if the mass continues, this baby won't survive, so what we're going to do, we're just going to go ahead and get rid of the baby. And it's kind of a mixed emotion, isn't it, right? You're thinking, no way, what? Wait, we just found out, and then now this is going to happen? So my wife and I began to pray and just kind of seek the Lord, and God led us to a Christian doctor, Dr. Park, in the, in the city of Downey, and he's a... Uh, a uh, Korean man who grew up in Brazil. He was a missionary kid. And so uh, Dr. Park, he's like, he's looking at us, and we, we find out he's a believer, we're believers. And, and I remember he said this. He's like, um, I believe your, your child will make it. And so he says, what we're going to do, we're going to do some surgery before the third month part. And, and as a result, you know, um, we believe this child will survive. And it's funny because had we listened to the urgent care, our son... My son, JJ, over there, he wouldn't be born. Had we listened to man as opposed to listening to God, that's the benefit of listening to God. See, the fruits of allowing God to test us, to know us, to know our anxiousness, the fruit of that is God's love. See, as I read through this, I, I, I see David's heart saying, God, I don't know, but you know. And that's okay, guys. There's a lot of things on this side of heaven we're not going to find out the answer to. I'd like to. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for the Lord, but on this side, we're not going to have those answers. All I have to do is be okay with it. But David doesn't just stop there. He says, and, he says, see if there's any wicked way in me. I like this, because David now says, God, if there's any unconfessed sin, God, if there's an unrestrained evil habit, God, if there's some, some bad disposition in me, would you point that out? And the word there says, if there's any wicked way in me, the word actually translated is, if there is any idolatrous way in me. And I started thinking about this. I started thinking about David. He was at a point where he held on to his life because that's all he had. And he was saying real simply, God, if there's any idolatrous way in me, would you remove that? David was saying, the God of my life was not my, my, my royalty. The God of my life was not my children. The God of my life was me. So God, would you knock me off that throne? And would you resume that position? David says here, see if there's any wicked way in me. Any way in me, in me that is unknown to myself. It was almost like he's saying, take me from it or take it from me. God, take me away from this situation or God, take this thing outside of me that I might know you. So that in the same way that David hated these wicked men, David is really saying, God, if there's any wicked way in me, I want, I want to hate it. I, I want to hate those things that I do. Paul, so 
explicitly shared, hey, I don't do those things I should be doing. I don't do those things I should be doing, but I'm doing those things I ought not to do. And even for us tonight, as God is maybe impressing upon your hearts those things that are going on in and through your life, maybe tonight it comes down to that, saying, God, if there's any wicked way in me, I confess it. God, if there's anything that I've said to my family, if there's any way I've treated a brother, if I have thought wrongly about somebody, God, reveal that. Reveal that in me. Take it from me. Another version says, point out anything wicked in me that offends you, O oh God. Maybe tonight God just needs to point the finger in that one area of your life. I don't know about you, but sometimes as Christians, we're pretty good actors, right? Good, pretty good actresses. If I ask you tonight, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so blessed. Oh, yeah, cool, cool. Praise the Lord, right? God is so good all the time, all the time. God is good, right? But is really that, that's what's, is that what's going on in your heart? Or is there more to it? And maybe God is just trying to point out those things in and through our lives. And finally, he says, and lead me in the way and the path of everlasting life. David, he simply says here, God, you search me, you know me, you've tested me, and if there's any wicked way within me, would you draw that out? And when all is said and done, please lead me. Please guide me. Please direct my path. As we know, Proverbs 3, 5, 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will direct your path. I like this. David says, lead me. If you want to be led, you have to trust the one that you're following. Isn't that correct? You have to trust the one that you're following. We went on a mission trip uh, to Scotland many, many years ago. And uh, I think I'm a good uh, GPS system uh, on my own, but I remember uh, we were lost. And there was a little boy, and he would say, so how do we get from this place to this place? And so I know. So he's leading us through these alleys. He's leading us through these corridors. He's leading us to all these various places. And there's a part of me is like, okay, um, we're putting the lives in danger of our team here. We have no idea. I had to trust this boy to lead us. Well, I, I love this. We don't have to trust the boy. All we got is, tr is trust our God, and he will lead us. Where, where's, where's God leading you today? Not next week, not next year, but where is God leading you if you're here this morning, maybe God's leading you to take a step of faith to be involved, maybe in missions, or take a step of faith to be involved in the nursery, or take a step of faith and be involved with security or the cafe, or maybe take a step of faith and share with that person next to you at work where it's really hard. Or maybe he's, he's telling you to, to, to be bold and at that next family party to share Jesus with that family member. Whatever he is, remind, be reminded as he leads you, he guides you. And where he leads you, he provides. And where he provides, he will give you everything that you need for that particular situation. He says, lead me in the way of everlasting. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, before the mountains were brought forth, or you ever had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And that's, that's where we end tonight, everlasting life, the things of eternity. And maybe for each of us tonight, that's where we need to end up. Not the things of this world. The things of this world is passing away. Investing in those things that will last, investing in eternity, investing in those things that won't rust, investing in those things that can't be stolen, Investing and putting your hope and trust in those things that aren't tangible. Please don't put your trust in a bank account, stocks and bonds, 401k. Don't, don't. It's going to fade. It's going to let you down. But trust in those things that are going to last for all eternity. I share this story uh, with uh, the third service today, but on our mission trip to uh, New York this past summer, uh, we were on a subway, and, uh, and it's kind of funny. 
It was a one day, and typically when we're on the subway, we'll break out the guitar and we'll start worshiping. And it's pretty obvious that people know we're Christian. But on this particular time, and maybe I was tired, maybe I can't remember what the situation was, we were just kind of hanging out on the subway, and we had our Team New York t-shirts on. And all of a sudden, um, this gentleman, his name was Frankie, kind of stocky dude, shaved head. He looked like he was from Brooklyn, all right? You, you kind of get the feeling here, right? And he says, what, what's, what's, what's up with that? And I was like, oh, Team New York. And so myself and, and a, another team member, we went over, and we started talking to him, and he's kind of sharing his heart. And looking at this guy, he was a tough dude. Like, I know all he had to do was breathe, and I'd fall over. You know, I was like, oh, man, if, if this dude got crazy with me, I already know, right? But as we began to talk to him, he was sharing how he was on his way to a, a psychiatrist and how he had tried God before and how he wanted God, but God wasn't doing anything. And it was so crazy. We began to pray over him, and this big, burly, crazy, tough-looking guy starts to weep on a public subway. And I'm almost like in shock. I was like, is he really crying? Right? Yeah. I was just like, what's really going on here? That's the Spirit of God. That's, who, that's what we're just singing about. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And I was, we were able to bring in uh, one of the guys from the church, and he got his number. And I says, hey, Frankie, you don't need a psychiatrist anymore. You've got Jesus now. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And even tonight, maybe you're like Frankie, and you need something or someone the answer is Jesus. It will always be Jesus. You can try to run. You can try to hide. You can try to front. You can try to act. You can do all those things. But the answer is always going to come back to Jesus. And so tonight, we're going to pray. And um, as we pray, um, just ask yourself, God, search my heart. Know my anxiousness. Know those things within me, God, that, that aren't right. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time and thank you for all that you're doing in and through us. And even tonight, God, you know our hearts. You know those things, God, that are, that are pressing in. God, you know those things, Lord, that, that are very difficult for us to comprehend. God, I even pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room that needs a healing, God, would you touch them? Even as we're praying, God, uh, whatever is ailing them, God, would you make it whole? I pray for those here, God, even in this room that are on the verge of a breakup in a marriage or a relationship, God, would you mend? Would you fix those things, God? Lord, you're the God of miracles. You're the God of impossibilities. So thank you, God, as David acknowledged that you were always there with him, as David acknowledged that you know him, Lord, we want to come to you in that way tonight. And so, Lord, uh, we come as we are, God. We come to you, and you said to come to you, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you would give us rest. So, God, we seek that tonight, Lord. We seek your face, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.